here at your conference this afternoon um, and I'm delighted to be able to, to talk to you about the UK's uh, admission service for higher education. Um, I have read the um, quality and diversity strategic agenda that your government has produced and I know that the Netherlands is facing a, a period of real change in terms of higher education um, in, re in relation to tuition fees, in relation to the uh, volume of study programmes um, and also in relation to the information and advice that are provided to students and in particular the extension of selection for admission to higher education. And that's really what I'm going to focus on this afternoon. Um, so over the next half an hour, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the situation, um, the policy environment for higher education in the United Kingdom, because it is complex and it explains in a way why we have the admission service that we do and why we have selection in admissions. I'm going to talk a bit about UCAS, which is the organisation I work for and the services that we provide. Um, I'm going to give a run-through of our basic undergraduate admissions service, which I hope will be of interest. And then at the end, I'm just going to say a little bit about some of the challenges that we face because we have selection for admission. So, to start off with, um, an overview of UK higher education. So, we have a large number of higher education providers in the UK. Um, we've got about 160 universities, um, and of those, some of those go back to the 13th and 14th centuries. And our newest university, the University of South Wales, um, was created earlier this year. And we've got about the same number of colleges, um, further education colleges, that also offer higher education courses, and a large number of private providers that offer a variety of undergraduate um, and higher education courses. Um, about 320 of those institutions are members of UCAS and use our services and they advertise and promote about 32,000 courses through our system. The standard higher education um, offering in the UK is a three-year full-time undergraduate um, honours programme. Um, in terms of the students, we've got about one and a half million full-time students and about half a million part-time students pursuing um, undergraduate degree programmes. Of those, about 89% are domestic UK students, about 4% from the EU and about 7% from elsewhere around the world. Um, the important thing to note is that for many courses and institutions, the student demand outstrips the number of places available and uh, hence the selection in admissions. Um, also wanted to point out that our average non-completion rate is about 6.5%, um, which I know is considerably lower than here in the Netherlands, but there is a lot of variation around that and our government is keen to reduce uh, dropout rates at the higher end. I have to say a word about secondary qualifications because the picture is very complicated in the UK. I'm sure many people have heard of A-levels, um, but actually only 50% of students go on to university with A-levels these days. There's an increasing uh, raft of qualifications, um, particularly vocational qualifications, that people are using to access higher education. There is also a separate system in Scotland. Um, and in the UK at the moment, we're seeing a lot of reform and change around secondary qualifications, which is creating issues for our own admissions people. So university admissions policy, the thing to say, the first thing to stress is that universities and colleges have autonomy over their own admissions. Each institution will have its own strategy and its own policy aligned to its institutional mission and its institutional goals. Um, admission also takes account of an individual. So selection and admission isn't just based on exam results. Um, it aims to look at the individual in the round and in particular to look at two aspects. The individual's prior achievement, which could be academic or work-related or personal, and the individual's future potential. And that would also include their motivation for wanting to pursue the course of study. Um, increasingly, assessment takes account of the individual's personal circumstances and perhaps more controversially, the kind of educational environment that they were in prior to higher education. And I will say a bit more about that. And of course, students provide the same information through UCAS when they apply to university, but that information is used in different ways by different institutions. Where institutions are selecting, 
Um, discriminating between a pool of highly qualified applicants is the priority. But where an institution is primarily recruiting, it's about making sure that the student has the skills and the ability and the motivation to, to complete the course and that they meet a minimum threshold for entry. So higher education policy in the UK, let me just say it's really, really complicated. Um, education and higher education policy are both devolved, which means England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are increasingly doing their own thing, their own policy, their own funding, they're, they're looking for different outcomes. So in England, the government is really pushing um, competition between universities and choice for students. It's encouraging more private providers to come in and provide higher education, um, and it's uh, making it easier for students to compete for the most qualified students. Um, in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's much more about coherent regional provision and actually keeping students at home, which I think is, is an interesting dynamic. Um, student funding, um, quite controversially, the UK increased tuition fees um, for home and EU students in 2012. Uh, most institutions now charge the maximum fee, which is just around €10,500 per annum for tuition. The thing to stress is that nobody pays the money up front. We have a system of low-cost loans, so students borrow the money from the government in order to go to university. And, uh, to increase the complexity, um, governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland subsidise students to various degrees, um, but in England you have to pay the full amount. So now I want to move on and talk about UCAS. So um, UCAS has been around for 52 years and I think we're incredibly proud of that um, in that we've been providing admission services to students in universities and colleges for over half a century. Um, we're an independent charity. Um, we're funded one-third by universities, one-third by students paying application fees, and one-third by our commercial activity. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, so we are, we're not a government body, and we're not centrally funded from the government. Um, and we like to say, as our mission statement says, we are at the heart of connecting people to higher education. Um, our core service is our um, admissions service for um, full-time undergraduate uh, education. So we offer a course search service, rather like the, the Studio Cruise uh, service here in the Netherlands, and also admissions and applications uh, like StudiLink. Um, and this is for home EU and international students. Um, we have a common timetable, uh, rules and processes, and this really gives three benefits. So first of all, it enables us to mediate and manage all of the interactions between the students, the school, the university, and qualifications awarding bodies. Um, it also um, means that students can't hold multiple offers. Um, they hold a defined set of offers. Um, and also, by having a common set of rules and timetables and processes, it gives students and parents and the general public confidence in the transparency and fairness of the admissions process. Um, I haven't got time to go through all of the rest of the things in this slide in detail, um, but I will just pick out that um, we offer a huge range of support services for students and for universities and schools in terms of we have a, a telephone contact centre, we do a huge amount of social media, we have lots of how-to videos on YouTube, um, we tweet and we use Facebook extensively. Um, when students have applied, they can track their applications online and schools and universities can track what's happening as well. And everybody gets reminders when key deadlines are coming up and decisions have to be made. Um, one of the key things that we do do is we receive the, the uh, examination results directly from awarding bodies um, in the summer before the results have been released and we package those together and we provide those to universities and colleges to help them make the final decisions on admissions. Um, and that, that's one of our key services that we provide to universities and colleges. Um, we also have a, a huge amount of very unique data which is of interest not only to universities and colleges but also policy makers and regulators. Now this whole system is paid for um, through an application fee which is uh, 27 euros that the students pay for five choices and a capitation fee that universities and colleges pay 21 euros for each student placed. 
Um, we also offer a range of other services, so we do search and application services for students at 16 who are looking to move to a different college uh, to study their, their A-levels or their further qualifications. Um, and we also run services for postgraduate teacher training, postgraduate taught master's courses, um, and specialist, uh, um, specialist institutions which provide music and dance courses. So um, just an idea of, of how big we are, um, 324 uh, member institutions last year, um, 650,000 undergraduate applications, 460,000 placed uh, students, um, 2.6 million choices, I always find that quite a staggering number. And uh, in terms of the examination results that we process, over 4 million of those that we process within a, a few days in August, which is one of our, one of our biggest challenges. Um, our overall our revenue is about 41 million euros um, and we've got a staff of about 450, so we're, we're a big organisation. So now I want to take you through the, the nuts and bolts of the admissions process. So there's six steps here. So first of all, the student choosing their courses. Secondly, applying. Thirdly, the institution assessing that application and making offers. Fourthly, the student responds to those offers. Then for those students that have conditional offers, um, there's the examination results processing and the final decision making. And for those who haven't been successful, we run a process called clearing. So I wanted to show you first, this is what students see when they're looking for courses on the new UCAS website. Um, our new course search went live um, only a couple of weeks ago and uh, it's been designed with huge input from students to provide them with the information they want in the format they want. So basically, a very simple search to start off with. The student can put in the subject that they're interested in and there's a whole range of different levels they can put that in at. Um, they can search by institution or they can search by geographical area. And I'm just going to show you a couple of the, research, the, the results that get returned. So firstly, a very simple list of courses comes back. So you can see up there, there's a list of institutions, the courses that the student has searched on, and it tells you um, where the course is actually physically going to take place, what qualification you get at the end, and what the mode of study is, and how long it takes. And then from that, the student can click through to get more information about the course content, um, and also the entry requirements that they need to meet to be in the course. Um, we also do a geographical search so the student can get a map that comes back with pinpoints on them showing them where in their local area or where they want to study uh, there might be courses of interest to them. Right, I'm now going to, to move on and show a short video. Um, it runs for about three minutes and it explains what the, the application process is from the student perspective. This video is a step-by-step -step guide on how to complete an application to university and college. We introduce each section so you can see what's required. First, you need to go to ucas.com to register your details on Apply, our online application system. You'll have to create a password and Apply will generate a username. Then you can log in to complete the different sections. The list on the left logs your progress. There'll be green dots next to sections in progress or red ticks where you've marked them as complete. Read each section carefully, answer any questions and then mark it as complete. Click on the question marks or on the help link to read extra advice. To start, We'll ask for details like your email address and what support you might need at university. Don't tick the criminal convictions box unless you have a criminal conviction that isn't spent. If you're from the UK, we ask for extra information about your background. In the choices section, select the universities and colleges you've chosen, the courses you're applying for and when you'd like to start the course. Enter the schools you went to, the qualifications you already have and those you're currently taking.
The next section asks about any jobs you've had, what you did and how long you spent there. The personal statement section is the only part of your application where you can write in your own style. It's your chance to tell the universities and colleges why they should offer you a place on their course. The last section is your reference. If you're applying through school or college, this won't show up in Apply because it will be arranged for you later. But if you're applying independently, you need to fill in your referee's details here. Click on the link to request a reference and we'll send an email to your referee with instructions. After entering all your information, click on View All Details. Check everything is correct and tick that section is complete. Once that's done, read and sign the declaration. If you're paying for your application online and not through a school or college, enter your card details. Your application is then sent to us. Or if you're applying through school or college, it'll go to your referee first so that they can add the reference. When we receive your application, we process it and send it online to each university and college you've chosen. If you can't find the answers you're looking for in the help sections of Apply, watch our other video guides to see how to complete specific sections. And there's plenty more advice at UCAS.com. Okay, well hopefully that gives you an overview of the student experience. Um, students fill in one form for up to five choices, um, which are in no preference or order, and UCAS sends all of those to the institutions at the same time. Um, when the institutions have the, uh, the applications, um, they're obviously assessed. Now, there is some element of central assessment by some universities, but other universities will send the applications out to their faculties or departments. Um, it really does vary quite significantly. Um, at this point, some institutions will require additional interviews. There might be additional tests, particularly for medicine, law, or mathematics, for example. Um, and in some cases, there will be auditions or requests for portfolios of work. And then once that assessment has happened, um, there's basically three possible outcomes for the student. First of all, they might get an unconditional offer, which basically the university is saying, yes, we want you, we'll give you a place. Um, now, this is normally only for older students who already have qualifications or plenty of relevant work experience. Most students, particularly 18, 19 year old students, will get a conditional offer. And a conditional offer says, yes, we will give you a place, but you have to demonstrate um, that you, you've got the, the required qualifications. So it's about achieving certain grades in certain subjects in certain examinations. There might also be requirements around criminal convictions or ability to work with children. And there might be language or financial um, conditions as well. Um, and thirdly, the, the university might just reject the application. So UCAS provides all of these, these offers um, and decisions back to students, and then the student has between zero and five choices. Um, now if a student has an unconditional offer and they want to take that up, they accept that straight away, and that's the end of the process. The student then goes on to enrol. Um, in many cases, though, students will have conditional offers, um, and they can pick one or two <coughs> conditional offers to hold until they've taken their exams, but they have to put them in order at this point, so they have to commit to a firm first choice and an insurance second choice. Um, and at this point, there is actually um, an element of a legally binding condition, because if the student then satisfies that offer, they are expected to go to that university or college or to withdraw from the process altogether. Um, and at this point, taking that decision is really important. So UCAS encourages students to get as much advice as possible, to talk to teachers, to talk to colleagues, um, and in particular, to visit the universities in question. Our student panel tell us that the university visit is the most important piece of information that students have when they decide which university to go to. Um, if a student unfortunately ended up with five rejections, they can now go back into the process and apply to one university at a time um, until they get an offer. So, um, exam results. Um, we get the exam results from awarding bodies about eight or nine days before they're published. Um, we package them up, we send them off to universities. It takes us about four days to process and package up those four million results. 
um, and then the universities have about five or six days to make their confirmation decisions. Um, the universities try to get through all of that before the results day, and most of them do. All the decisions come back to us, and then on the results day, we release all of that information to students so they find out did they get in or did they not get in. Um, again, three outcomes. Either they've been confirmed because they met the conditions or almost met the conditions, um, or, they were reject or they didn't meet the conditions and they were rejected. And in some cases, there will be students waiting for more information because some exam results come a bit later than others. So if the student accepted the, the offer and met the conditions, then they're in, and that's great. Um, and also, if a student um, really exceeded their offer and did much better than they were expected to, they can use something called adjustment. Um, and this enables them to, I don't really like to use the words trading up, but it does enable them to look to move to perhaps a university that they feel they would rather go to. Very short window of time to do that, and it's not actually a very well-used service, partly because I think people have invested so much energy and effort into finding the institution that was right for them, they don't want to change at the last minute. Um, if a student didn't get in, they can register to use a process called clearing. So UCAS publishes on its course site um, a list of all the universities and courses that still have places, and we effectively try to match make, to match, match make, yes, um, students who don't have a place with universities who are looking for them. So um, students register to use clearing, and then they phone up or contact the universities directly, discuss the opportunity for a place. If the university and the student are happy, that information comes into UCAS, we tick the box, and it's done, and the students go on to enrol. Um, and every year, about 10%, 10 11% of students uh, go into university through that process. Um, just to give you a quick idea of the timetable, um, the uh, course search and apply goes live in June. In fact, this year, uh, the uh, service went live today, at least I hope it did. And uh, students can start to submit applications from September. First deadline is the 15th of October, which is medicine, dentistry, Oxford and Cambridge. But the main submission deadline is the 15th of January, and most students do use that. Um, I won't go through the details on there because you'll have all the slides to take away. Um, but it just gives you an idea of the fact that we run each cycle over about 18 months or so. So um, this is the, the cycle in numbers. Um, I suspect it's not terribly easy to see, uh, but again, it gives you an idea, I think, of the volume of students that we have going through the system, the volume of choices, examination results, um, offers, and then where students end up getting placed. So I wanted to conclude, really, by saying a bit about some of the challenges of running a, a competitive um, and selective admissions system. And uh, I think one of those, irrespective of the demand for courses, is all about, well, how, how do you assess an individual in a, in a holistic and rounded way? You know, how do you make assessments about someone's previous achievement and their potential? So in terms of prior attainment, um, I think we find it quite difficult, even with qualifications frameworks, to compare different kinds of qualifications, particularly where students might have taken combinations of qualifications. Um, and assessing work experience, I think, is, is really difficult. Um, I think there's an interesting question about, does it matter where a student went to school? I think increasingly our government thinks, thinks it does. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and I will come on and say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, evaluating potential, incredibly, incredibly subjective. Um, one of the ways that we evaluate potential at the moment is looking at the predicted grades that a student might be going to achieve. Um, and then this raises questions, well, how accurate are those predictions? And the answer is actually, well, not very. Um, and to make matters worse, it varies by subject and it varies by the level of achievement. Um, and we know that schools and colleges tend to over-predict, particularly at the upper end as well, around people predicted to get A's and B's. Um, I think as well, um, there is this whole issue about uh, the environment that the student was in and how much opportunity have they had to demonstrate their potential. Um, at the moment, uh, there's quite a, a hot political issue about whether universities should make what the government calls contextual offers. 
i.e. that you make a, a lower conditional offer to a student who might have been to uh, a deprived school or grown up in a deprived area. And I think there's, there's a really strong divergence of opinion at the moment about whether or not that is the right thing to do. Um, fair admissions is a very big issue for us. Um, particularly where institutions and courses are heavily oversubscribed. It's important that admissions are fair and transparent and can be demonstrated to be so. Um, we have a, a statement of, about what we think fair admissions is and, and that's up on the screen and I, I won't like, read through it, um, but these are our, our principles about what fair admissions is all about. Um, we also fund UCAS and universities fund an organisation called SPA, Supporting Professionalisation in Admissions. And this small team of people works with admissions staff in universities to help identify and promote good practice in fairness in admissions. Um, information for students, um, incredibly important. And uh, our government uh, is putting increasing emphasis um, on comparable statistical information about programs and institutions to help inform students' choices. So we have a national student survey that has been running for many years um, and the results of that are published by the name of the institution and the program so students can see how satisfied other students are with the course. Um, and we have something new called the key information set that the government introduced last year um, which provides a set of common statistics about things like um, how much face-to-face uh, -face study time can students expect on a particular program, um, what professional bodies recognise the, the degree that is awarded, um, and how much does it cost, and in particular, what happens to the graduates six months after graduation, where are they, what are they doing, and how much are they earning. And that information, production of that information, is now part of the official institutional audit that universities go through um, with the regulator. So finally, um, I just wanted to say something a bit about the competitive environment. Um, now that we have a situation in the UK where block grants for teaching funding have been reduced, the money really does follow the student. So where in the past a university could be confident it was going to get a block grant for teaching each year, now it has to bring in the students because the students bring in the tuition fee income that pays for the teaching. So what we're starting to see is a really strong growth in competition between universities and colleges for students and particularly for the best students. Um, and we're actually starting to see much more recruitment and um, rather than selection because it's actually about getting the people through the door because they bring the money with them. Um, we're seeing really different tactics in terms of marketing and outreach and university branding. And that in turn places different pressures and demands on UCAS as universities want different things from us. Um, and we're also starting to see some institutions bending the rules a little bit. I talked about the importance of having a common uh, set of deadlines and a timetable and a common set of processes that everybody signs up to. Um, but I, I think we're starting to see those bent a little bit around the edges. And that also raises questions for us about, well, what's our role in this? We don't want to be a, a policeman, um, but we have to put the student and the public interest to the fore as well. Um, so I think we've got some, some really interesting challenges in the future, just as you all have as well. Some different ones, but some that are the same. So uh, I wanted to finish there um, to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, I haven't got time to take questions, um, but I'm really happy to talk to anybody um, later on this afternoon. So thank you very much for listening. I've really enjoyed it.